All right. And with that, I think we're live, which is excellent. I'm so excited for today's um, Real Talk Live, but I won't get ahead of myself. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today for this uh, very special Real Talk Live. Real Talk is a series where we try to bring together the best minds in tech to go behind the scenes and then on in the nitty gritty of what the tech life is all about. I'm Amy Young. I'm Springboard's uh, community and content manager. And today we're going to be talking about tech sales. Um, we recently launched a tech sales career track, which trains and teaches students sort of sales structures, scripting, tech stacks, and best practices in live settings and also with one on one mentorship. And there's literally no one better to talk to about joining a tech sales team than Jonathan Gregg, who helped design the course of all people. So a little bit about Jonathan, and we'll jump into this in a second. But Jonathan has years of sales experience under his belt, working at companies like ADP and HelloSign. He's currently leading a team of 35 sales development reps or SDRs, and you'll hear that in this conversation, but he's currently at Electronique, an SF startup that makes no and low code IT automation tools, which is a mouthful. So Jonathan, thank you so much for joining today. This is wonderful. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And actually I think um, circling back a great place to start is that you were not initially <laughs> in sales you your background is is somewhere else could you please walk us through sort of where you started and how you got to where you are today yeah i actually started off life as a programmer um, and then went to graduate school for operations sales was nowhere on my radar whatsoever um i spent a few years in operations post post mba um, and then ended up in portland um and there was a sales operations job i didn't know anything particularly about sales operations but I knew about operations and it was transferable. So I got into tech sales that way on the operations side, um, got very involved with leading SDR teams with hiring the SDRs and kind of transitioned from sales operations to more of sales management leadership. And it's been seven, eight years since then. Yeah, which is incredible. And I think I, that's actually really nice because similarly, um, I first jumped into tech with this company, but on the sales team myself in a sales operations role. So I think that just speaks volumes about how sales teams are really valuable for people who are wanting to get access into these cool companies who are solving stuff. But we'll get to that in a bit, which is great. So you said this has been seven or eight years. You come from a programming background. I don't think it's very often that people that come from a programming background literally choose to pivot to sales. So what has made you so pleased and satisfied with the sales career so far? Um, the tech, the programming background gives you a little bit of, of a leg up because you understand a lot of the technologies that potentially that you're going to be selling. Um, I think that the thing that really made sales appealing to me is because I do come from an operations background, especially on the SDR side, as opposed to the AE side, it's very process driven. Um, you have certain steps, certain procedures, certain processes you need to do. Um, there's definitely some sales technique involved, but as opposed to the AE, where it's a lot more of sales technique, the SDR role in particular has quite a large component of process drivenness. Um, and that has been very attractive to me, the combination of sales and process. Sales and process, for sure. And I think just like kicking it back for a second, um, SDR stands for Sales development representative, and you can also use BDR, business development representative. They're used fairly interchangeably. Excellent. And you also said a &E, which is a... An account executive. So traditionally, you start off if you have no experience as an SDR. You do that for nine to 18 months or so. Um, do that successfully, and then you get promoted to, a, to an account executive, where instead of traditionally, you might be sourcing your own meetings some, but you're closing deals. Um, that's really the goal of every SDR is to move up to, to an AE. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's actually a nice transition just to like, because as you just said, sales teams are often like intros to tech companies. So mm -hmm. taking a second, how are tech sales teams generally, like what do they, what's the makeup? What do they generally look like? You start as an SDR and then what are the other roles that you're going to encounter when you join a tech sales team? So if you're getting into tech sales with no tech sales experience, it's pretty hard to go into an eight year old directly. It's not completely unheard of, but it's it's definitely a challenge. Traditionally, you'll start even if you've been a closer in, say, the car car industry or something like that, you'll start off as an SDR. 
um, prove yourself, like I said, for like nine to 18 months. From there, there's a few different roles you can go into. Traditionally, and most SDRs want to become account executives. Um, you know, you're looking at 200, 300,000 in earnings there, potentially, like it's a pretty lucrative career path. Mm -hmm. um, some people go into a leadership role. Like I will never go into full-time closing. It's just not me. Um, so you can go into a team lead, a manager, a director kind of role over SDRs. Um, that's what I do. You can also go into, say, customer success. You will have those customer, customer communication skills. Um, you'll be used to, used to entering things in the system. So it's a, it's a pretty good transition into customer success. Um, you can also go into marketing. That's a little bit less common. The skill set isn't quite as transferable. But you'll be working with marketing departments a lot. So if that is where your interest is, you will have direct interaction with them on a daily, weekly basis. And you can get to know them. You can get their advice. I mean, they'll get to know you and be comfortable with you to where if you don't traditionally have the skill set they might be looking for to move into marketing, once they know you, they'll be much more open to taking a chance on you. Yeah, for sure. And like knowing that you manage SDRs and have probably seen a lot of different paths that lead to different things. I think that's A, a really cool perspective and B, great to validate that this is like a really core place to start if you're also looking into like what else is out there from like a tech perspective. Um, knowing that you manage, I think you said 35 SDRs. Is oh, that right? Wow. Yeah. Um, and knowing that that's the place that a lot of people start. And that's also, you know, certainly what our tech sales program trains people for. Um, you know, you manage a lot of people and I'd love to hear what makes someone a successful SDR. I think there's a couple of different things. Um, obviously having a little bit of a background in sales is beneficial, but the biggest things that lead to success as an SDR are really innate to the person. Um, ability to think quickly on your feet, to be able to think and react and talk. The ability to be told no a lot and keep doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, for instance, you're going to contact, I don't know, 100 to 200 prospects in the course of a week, and five of them will say yes. Like you get told a lot, you have to get told no a lot. You have to have a lot of that resiliency. Um, and the ability to, to adapt and change. The market changes so often. What works for you now, three months from now, the messaging you're using might not work. You might need to start using videos instead of LinkedIn. Like there's a lot of different things. So you have to be intellectually curious, like your team, your leadership, um, your marketing department potentially will tell you things that work and some best practices, but there's also a lot of experimentation on your own. You need to find what works for you. Um, yeah. You need to find your own style. So there's, there's a lot of freedom involved in there. So you need to be intellectually curious. Yeah, definitely. And I think, I mean, I've noticed just from my own personal experience that the products and things that we're selling are generally very nuanced and specific and you have to know those nuances and specificities and how they change and what people want to map them to and you know things like that so it is definitely can confirm is very fast-paced <laughs> regardless when, <laughs> but i mean on the flip side the, the cool thing is like i said it's a it's a 9 to 18 month career track or potentially for ae so you're not in this forever you don't have time to like sit and be comfortable and bored you're always learning new things you're always trying new things and one of the biggest things that'll make you attractive for that promotion is like you come to your manager like, hey, I've tried this new whatever and it's working and nobody else has thought of it. Coming up with those ideas is A, fun and B, helps your career quite a bit. Yeah. Okay. And we'll jump into like the granular bits of um, SDRdom in a bit. Is that I'm a curious. word? Is that a bit like SDRdom? SDRdom? Is that like an actual thing? I don't think so. But it started here. And I love that idea that we've left our mark in some way by creating new language. So here we are. <laughs> um, I think you're, you're very gung-ho about tech sales careers. I know that like in our conversations beforehand, you've been like, I don't understand why like doctors and lawyers aren't in this field. Um, why is tech sales such an exciting opportunity right now? I think there's a couple of different things. Like I, I say to everybody that'll listen, if you're not having a... a rocket ship career path as a professional somewhere this is the job that everybody should try to do mm -hmm. um for a couple of different reasons one there's a fairer, fairly low barrier to entry most of the the roles probably 75 percent plus don't require a college degree um they don't require prior experience so you can get into these roles without having an expensive background um there's a lot of opportunity for growth uh like i said you can be making two three hundred thousand dollars in two three four years like i don't know of any other career path that in four years you could be making two hundred fifty thousand dollars. 
this is an amazing career path that anybody can get into. Yeah. And that's coming from a former programmer too, which I think <laughs> volumes. <laughs> um, and also touching on compensation, just because I think it's can be hard to find, you know, compensation structure is different for sales reps and, you know, folks than it is for any other salaried employee. Um, can you just like lightly talk through how SDR compensation is structured and sort of what to expect when that happens? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a, obviously different by size of company. There, there's a bunch of variables, but in general, it's a mix of, of base plus commission. You're generally looking at fifty to sixty thousand dollars base, twenty to thirty thousand dollars variable. Um, mm-hmm. A little bit higher on the coast, maybe a little bit lower if you're strictly remote. Um, those, that's generally the parameters. Um, as you move up the chain, a starting AE will be like hundred base, a hundred uh, bonus, so two hundred OTE. Um, maybe a little bit higher than that. And then the sky's the limit from there for an AE. I mean, they go up to three, four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for maybe I'll be maybe I'll become an SDR. There's some pretty good money in this field. It's it's not a bad (laughs) thing to go into. Great news in this economy. Absolutely. Um (laughs) I think what's also important to talk about too is like, yes, money is great. I think also culture is really important. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, we've talked about for sure that sales, when people hear sales, I think they tend to immediately think of like used car salesmen. Um, could you lend a little perspective on how uh, tech sales culture is different from other industries? I think there's a couple of different things. One tech in general is different than almost any other industry on the planet much more in tune with caring about their employees, with work-life balance. Um, that's stereotyping a little bit, but tech in general seems is much more focused on employee welfare and employee happiness um, as opposed to like, car sales. Um, tech sales in particular, as opposed to normal sales, it's much more collaborative and listening as opposed to like smooth talking and trying to convince somebody of something they don't necessarily want. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you're selling a good product, like somebody wants it, somebody needs it, so it's not necessarily like convincing somebody who doesn't need what you have to just buy it anyway. It's really discovering what their needs are and looking at how your product fits and just matching them. Um, so it's not really that slick talking, convincing thing. And I think the third thing, the third thing is tech sales tends to be a lot more collaborative than a lot of other sales fields. So for instance, if you don't get quota relief when you go on vacation for two weeks, one of your colleagues will pick up some of your meetings for you a lot of the times, proceed along the way, and you'll still get credit for it. And you'll do the same for them when, when they're out on vacation. So the folks work together a lot more than a lot of other fields. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot more collaboration and, and friendliness than in some super hyper competitive um, other sales fields. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've certainly felt that. Um, excellent. If any, we're taking questions in about 15 minutes. So if anyone has any other you know, questions, feel free to put it in the chat about sort of like overarching, how is tech sales different than other things? Um, but I think it'd be helpful to talk about SDRs more granularly, what makes them successful, especially since you manage so many. Um, so just to kick off that side of things, you manage a lot of them. What is the biggest challenge for most new SDRs and maybe with the ones that you manage, but also uh, in the ones that you've run into over the past seven or eight years in this career? I think there's two different things. One of them is what I hit on before is you're going to get told no 95% plus of the time. And that's just the job. If you get a yes, 5% of the time, you're doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's that. You're just getting adjusting your mind that you're going to fail most of the time and still be awesome. Um, that takes a little bit of work to wrap your head around. Um, and the other thing I think is that it's, while there is a sales and communication component to it, like I said before, it's very process driven. Most of the times the places you'll go will have established processes. So it's not just enough to reach out to somebody. You need to reach out to them in the right way with the right frequency. You need to be following up. Um, little things like entering your follow-up tasks into whatever CRM you have sounds trivial and it actually is a little bit annoying because I don't want to enter stuff into the CRM, but as you get in the habit of it and you just systematically have your system tell you to follow up and those follow-ups lead to meetings, you start to see that, oh, as long as I follow the process, like it starts to come along. Um, 
and really overcoming that in the, in the beginning, it seems like an annoyance, but it's fundamental to every successful rep I've ever been around is they follow the process and they, they follow the process specifically. Um, that takes a little bit of adjusting to you to make you go from feeling like busy work to one of the foundations of your success. Yeah, definitely. And taking a quick pause here, just because, you know, CRM, what does that stand for? And what are examples of a CRM? Uh, customer relationship management. The two biggest ones are Salesforce and HubSpot. There's a few others out there, but the vast, vast majority of places will be Salesforce or HubSpot. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that's just powerful because it's sort of like a record of truth that everyone can see like what one lead or person has interacted and touched across the course of a company. The um, one nice thing, we'll probably get into this a little bit later when we get into the course specifics. If you learn one of the CRMs, like you're, you'll be pretty good at the other one. Like it's not like you learn uh, Salesforce and can't transition to HubSpot. They're roughly-ish the same. Um, so it doesn't really matter what you learn as long as you get used to using one. Um, it's it's pretty transferable knowledge. Yeah, actually, that was an excellent segue because my next question was, um, you know, based on your experience, what were the things that you wanted to make sure to include in this springboard curriculum? I know CRM is one. Mm -hmm. So the, the tools um, are definitely important. I've been involved in three of these kind of training programs before. The thing that I really liked about Springboard that differentiates it from some of the other ones that I've been involved with is the live feedback with the coaches. Um, there's a huge difference between just going through some online videos and tutorials, Like you can learn the tools that way. Um, but honestly, I can train a new rep on the tools in a few weeks. Like it's not that big of a deal. Having that interactiveness with the career coaches, helping you with your resume, helping you with LinkedIn, helping you with call training, like your first few calls when you started your new SDR job, you're freaking off. You've never done this before. You have no idea what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so going into it with at least some idea of what to expect will give you a huge leg up on somebody who's never done it before. So you're not being absolutely horrid in those first few calls. You already have a baseline, which means you can ramp up a lot faster than your peers, which means you will stand out in the promotion track a lot faster than your peers. And it just compounds from there. So having the Having that live feedback, having the resume is up to date, it's a huge differentiator. Yeah, definitely. Like we cannot overstate the importance of just like practice and physically talking in front of another person. Cause I know like I have phone anxiety and hats off to SDRs and ISRs. They have um, the world's hardest job and nothing but respect. Um, it's not easy skill to learn. Your first few no. months are learning that. Yeah, for sure. And I know that it can be, you know, when you're selling things that are very specific, it's like the, the probability of messing something up and it's just, it's a whole thing. So yes, live practice. Very good. Um, do most of your SDRs come from a traditional sales background or what even is a traditional sales background? So I would say a traditional sales background in this field is having been an SDR at a tech firm before. Yeah, the vast majority of people I've, I've hired in my career do not, um, and I don't think anybody on my current team, maybe one or two, but no, the super vast majority did not. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> oftentimes, folks that come from say an educational background are a super good fit. They're used to thinking in structure. They're used to communicating messages. Like that's a great background. Um, yeah, I can't think of very many. <laughs> Part of it is, though, if you're successful as an SDR for, say, 9 to 18 months, you're not an SDR anymore. You're not looking for a new SDR job. If you've right. been an SDR for five, six, seven years, either you love the job or you're not very good at it. So you don't see a whole lot of people with years of SDR experience. Yeah, for sure. Um, which is good to hear. And if that is the case, because I know often when people are applying to jobs, they can point to previous experience and be like, look at this really key metric and thing that I did. Like, you should hire me because of this. Yeah. Um, but if you're coming into a sales job and you don't have that um, ARR, which stands for, this sounds Annual like- a recurring revenue. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't mean to make it sound, but like if, if you don't have quotas mm -hmm. that you've met in the past, just because you haven't had that experience, what do you try to focus on um, in that interview process. So I'll answer that in one second. The one thing I will preface that with though, is if you do have that experience, you better talk about quota achievement. I can't tell you how many folks I've had that say that they have sales experience and don't talk about quota achievement. Like we live and die quota achievement. That's, that's our entire world. Okay. If you don't talk about that and you claim you had the experience, you sucked at it. Like 
because you would be bragging about it if you did. So if you have that, make sure well, to talk about it. Let's put a pin in that because I think it's important too, because like if you, people are bad at things when they start out, right? Like mm -hmm. we were just talking about, you need the practice and you need the reps. And I think it's important too to like, if you know what quota achievement is like how, but you didn't achieve quota exactly. How do you frame that? Yeah, you can definitely right? work around it, but you better talk about it. Sure. Um, as far as what we look for as in the reps, um, again, it's the ability to think fast and communicate on your feet, um, to be able to process information and respond in a fairly rapid or articulate way. Um, something that shows perseverance or leadership or intellectual curiosity. Um, you were a team leader in college, you led a club, you joined Toastmasters, like something to show that you're about personal development really goes a long way. Um, taking a course like Springboard definitely sets you apart from others. It's one thing to say you want to transition into sales. It's another thing to say, I want to transition and do it. And I did these steps to show that I'm actively working on getting better. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think those things are definitely differentiators as you're interviewing. Yeah, definitely. Are there um, in the interview process, are there sort of typical questions that people should prepare for? No, quotas is one. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, are there certain questions that you always try to make sure to ask? I think one of my favorites and one that I've seen done at the various organizations that I've been to is pitch me something that you're passionate about. It could be flamingos, the ballet, soccer. Like, I don't care what it is. Anything you're passionate about, pitch me on it. Um, and part of that is you should already be excited about it. So you should, the passion should come out in your voice. Hopefully you're passionate about whatever product you're selling. But if you're like a Lakers fan, you should be excited about talking about the Lakers. If it doesn't come across about something you're saying you're already excited about, that's usually not a great sign. It can be overcome, but that's one of the, my, my favorite interview questions and one I've seen pretty much everywhere I've ever been. Yeah. What was an interview question that you've been asked that you, that's stuck with you? Uh, um, what, what is your spirit animal? Oh. <laughs> I still don't know what the right answer to that is. Um, I don't even I know. Think that's a lot of times, question. folks will, will, will ask an uh, interview question that's just out of the blue, um, mm -hmm. just to see how you respond to something that's completely unexpected. Because a lot of times, folks will prep for kind of the common interview questions, and so you'll get thrown a curveball. Like there is no right answer at all. Just do you respond, or do you just sit there? Uh, like that's mm -hmm. not good. Yeah. Um, on the flip side, are there certain questions that someone should always ask? The first thing I would say is always ask a question or two. Um, sure. if for me and for a lot of other folks, if you don't ask a question, you don't get the job. Like it shows that you're not interested, that that's just a deal breaker. Um, mm -hmm. I would generally ask when you're, when you're talking to a company, um, in today's environment, I'd probably ask something about how well capitalized they are. Um, it's a challenging economic environment. You want to make sure the company's going to be around. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd definitely ask what percentage of their current reps are meeting quota. If you have a $30,000 target bonus and only 5% are meeting it, like it's not really a $30,000 target bonus. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile to find out how attainable that is. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, if you're interviewing for an outbound position as opposed to an inbound, I'd ask where the leads come from. Um, mm -hmm. A position where you are responsible for going on Google and finding all of your leads, as opposed to a position where the marketing department gives you leads that have phone numbers and emails attached are two hugely different positions. Um, so I definitely get some insight into that as well. Definitely. Okay. So just to recap, because I think there, there are some nuances here that I just want to like double click on, right? Um, knowing if it's outbound versus inbound is pretty key. They're very um, different jobs. Totally different jobs. Whether sourcing is part of your job or whether marketing's purpose is to qualify leads for you and mm -hmm. you don't have to do that work yourself. Um, and you mentioned, you know, what percentage of uh, sales folks are attaining that target bonus? Yes. That's what you said. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. In this hypothetical, someone gets the SDR job. Okay. Amazing. What are, how should they be focusing their time in the first month on the job? In general, your first month is going to be largely dictated by whatever onboarding program your company has. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, at my company, the first two or three weeks are pretty much strict, strictly learning, reading various things, uh, video tutorials, um, just call practice, 
So the first two to four weeks are largely going to be scripted for you by your, by your onboarding team for the most part. Yeah. One of the things that I think is really key that can set you apart is there's a, and I can't think of them off the top of my head. We can post it later. Um, but there's a lot of YouTube resources and podcast resources on how to have SDR conversations. Um, I would just spend 30 minutes a day or something listening to these because after the, you'll have your call training, your call practice. But if you just invest some extra effort into actually listening to how the experts talk about this, you'll be so far ahead of your peers. And again, mm-hmm. that'll just compound because you're going to be ahead of them. You'll just keep growing faster and faster than them. And you'll, you'll hit target much faster than your peers will. So I would definitely listen to some of those resources. Definitely. Um, are there any other resources off the top of your head that have been helpful for you in the past? Um, if you want to do a little bit of extra training on whatever CRM you're in, um, you'll learn that on the job throughout time. But if you just invest, you know, three or four hours on a weekend to learn HubSpot or Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using, that will help because a lot of your job will be focused on just entering stuff into the CRM. Being able yeah. to do it faster, even if you save 30 seconds per lead, like you add that up over hundreds of leads and it starts to matter. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're rounding out the pat, like the final couple questions here for sort of like the, the me talking portion. So if people want to pepper in their questions for the Q&A afterwards, we blocked 15 minutes for that Q&A, um, but I think we, we're, all, we, we're relatively flexible. So if they're more than that or less than that, this is very much meant as an open conversation. Um, but I have still have a couple questions and <laughs> while I have the floor, I'm going to take it. Okay. Um, what no, we talked before about um, how there are obviously like now multiple ways to follow up with like on the sales front. When you're starting out as an SDR, you're, it sounds like you're going to be on the phone a lot. And like the main part is, is, you know, having that cadence and figuring out your style Mm -hmm. on the phone. Are there any pieces of advice um, when you're on the phone with somebody, since it's so different than being in person, it's so different than following up on email. Are there pieces of advice that you have for being on the phone that you give to you to your SDRs? I think probably the hardest Thing that most new SDRs have not been on the phone before um, have is when it comes to objection handling, a lot of times so somebody will give you some objection and you immediately want to give some reason to overcome that or some reason why it's wrong or some reason to move past it. Even fairly experienced folks forget to acknowledge that they told you the objection. Um, so, I mean, it's just like even an interpersonal, like I heard you, I acknowledge what you said, and then you can move on. If you skip, I mean, it's a two second transition but if you skip that, I heard you, I know it's important and it's a valid concern. It feel, it becomes much more confrontational as opposed to a transition of, I get it and let's move on from that. Um, and you do not want to get in a confrontational relationship with the person you're on the phone with because they'll win, like they will. Um, yeah, yeah. So you really want to acknowledge what they said um, and, and folks get so used to overcoming the objection and that is important, but acknowledging the object, objection is super important as well. And it takes a second or two. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Cause then like, don't make the conversation adversarial. I think that's a really solid piece of advice. Um, any other tidbits that you can, that you can give us while we have you. The other thing that I'd probably add is, and most of the sales leaders wouldn't say this, not every SDR is super on the phone. You don't have to be great on the phone to be a great SDR. I have some folks that get the vast majority of their meetings from emails and from LinkedIn messages. Um, and that's, that's their comfort zone and that's where they crush it. They do it on the phone. They do what they need to do. Um, I would say to become an AE, you need to be great on the phone. Um, but to be a successful SB, SDR, especially when you're just starting out and learning those phone skills, you can be a, a wonderful SDR in writing and learn the phone skills along the way. So if that's what you're good at, do it while you learn the phone skills. Excellent. Yeah. I think that's, if anything, that shows that you're a great manager. Your SDRs, those 35 people are very lucky. I have some good people. <laughs> and it's nice to see that you care about them so much because I think that's true. It's nice to like, I don't know if I really considered how individual being an SDR or a salesperson at any level could be. It is. That you can really tailor it to whatever way you like to interact with humans generally, which is fun. I think it gets, I mean, especially in today's remote world, it can get a little bit of isolate, isolating, is that a word? You can be somewhat isolated because you're not, traditionally SDRs have been in a room, there's 20 or 30 of them in a room all together and making a lot of noise. In the remote world, you're sitting at home and you don't have contact, so it can be isolated. 
Um, so having that contact with your team and with your manager really does help. Um, so yeah, you're not just yeah. sitting there all by yourself getting told no 40 times a day. Yeah, I know. Isolation is is hard for sure. Um, excellent. Okay, we have a couple questions coming in, but I think final question for you. Um, and just like with all of our, bringing it back to sort of the springboard course, and we fully acknowledge that like our, our courses are designed very specifically for, you know, people who are, are looking for, you know, remote learning that is like part-time along other things. Um, and people don't have to take this course, right? What are some reasons that they should consider it? Do you think? So there's three things that come to mind. One, if you and somebody else are both telling the hiring manager they want to get into tech sales, the other person has done nothing and you've taken a course, it already shows that you're more committed than they are. Um, you, the hiring manager will suspect that you have extra skills, but they'll know that you're at least more committed because you put in the time and probably the money. Um, the other thing, the other two things would be familiarity with the tools. You'll come in knowing something about CRMs. You'll know something probably about sales automation software. There's a couple of big ones out there but you at least know about the concepts around sales automation. Um, you'll have some phone practice, so you won't be stumbling as much. Um, you know, I, I think before I went to graduate school, I went to, to Beijing to learn Mandarin and I knew some Mandarin. So I could at least start to participate in the course and like catch on much faster than if you didn't know anything. If you start a new SDR role, having some phone skills, your ability to catch on much, much faster and start to grasp the nuances of what you're being taught as opposed to just what do I say? Being able to catch those nuances will help you scale and grow much faster. It's a, it's a huge leg up. Yeah, definitely. All right. I'd sell anything that you pitch me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, pivoting ever so smoothly to a couple questions that we're actually getting. And I think um, you've, you have spoken about this, I know to me in the past, are these jobs usually remote friendly? I'd say probably about half right now. It's been, it's much more remote friendly after COVID than it was before. Mm -hmm. um, probably more than half of them are remote friendly, maybe more. Yeah, for sure. Um, for instance, my team is 35 people in 15 different countries. Like there's two or three of us in the United States. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, a lot of them are very remote friendly. Yeah, which is good. And adds to like the flexibility element that we were talking about before too. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the next question. Uh, a lot of startups are feeling a changing investment environment, and there have been a lot of layoffs. How do sales orgs prepare for a dry spell, and how safe are sales jobs from economic downturns? So every organization will react differently. That's why earlier I said one of the reasons you probably want to ask in your interview is what is their funding situation like? Um, somebody who has four months of runway is a lot different than a company who has two years of runway or doesn't need to raise at all. Um, that's a very material thing in today's environment to ask. Um, they're not going to tell you specifically, but you can generally get an idea of where they're at and how much runway they have. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, how, how sales teams prepare and also how safe sales jobs are okay, okay. from layoff. Um, how they prepare most, uh, at least in the SaaS world, it's usually annual recurring revenue. So you don't have as big of surprise on revenue from year to year. As long as you have a pretty decent retention, you have some predictability to your revenue. So mm -hmm. SaaS companies tend not to see some of the huge swings that you'll see in other industries. How you prepare, and we're, at, you know, my organization, we're going through this right now, is you evaluate, you reevaluate your sales plan, potentially moderate your hiring a little bit. Um, how safe are sales jobs? It could be the worst economy on the planet. If you're a good salesperson and you bring in more revenue than you cost, you'll always have a job. Like if you go to somebody and say, you pay me a hundred thousand dollars and I'll give you back $500,000, you're going to have that job no matter what the economy. Um, so if you're a below average person, it's not that safe for you. If you're producing results, like you're going to be safe. Um, there, there's always room for somebody who brings in revenue. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, double clicking on, I keep saying double clicking. I've never said that before, but now's the time we're creating words. We're, we're changing all it's great. Um, <laughs> Well, I think it's important to you that like we're talking about startups and sort of a lot of small businesses in this like grander economic equation. And I think the unspoken thing there is that most sales jobs and most SDR jobs are going to be with either startups or smaller to mid-sized companies. Um, 
And I think that's something that people may not realize. Like you might immediately think that you're going to go immediately start working for like a bigger company just because, Mm -hmm. you know, they must be bigger. They must be hiring more SDRs. But the reality is that you are going to be working for probably a a series of smaller companies is like, would you say that that's, that's true? Absolutely. I mean, there's like, you know, Salesforce and outreach and there's a few huge SDR employers out there. There's not that many of them. There's thousands of startups that are hiring SDRs. The yeah. vast majority of these are startups or series A or B. Like they're not huge companies. Yeah. Which is also cool because like a lot of them have really cool products and gets you exposure to like new things and yada, yada. These people. One of the things that I've found really interesting as part of my journey is I've, I worked at ADP, which was a huge company. But after that, I worked with all startups of varying sizes. And it's really interesting as you go, like I started... And it was, I don't know, we were 40 or 50 employees a year and a half ago. Um, we're 300 now. And the series of changes you go through and the series of different processes and procedures, it's fun to grow with a company and, you know, level up each, each round, each year, um, as opposed to if you go be an SDR at Salesforce, you'll get world-class training, but it's, you know, nothing's going to change. They have their process. It is what it is. It's very successful. Um, but like, you're not going to be improving, changing. There's only so much you can do, as opposed to if you go to, you know, a series A startup, they're not going to have all that in place. There's a huge opportunities for growth, um, much more so than at a structured place like Salesforce. Salesforce is great, but it's not, it's not for me. For sure. And also you can just immediately, like, it's got to be really rewarding too, just to know that you're immediately having an, like a positive effect on a company and you are. Yeah, it's, you have a material effect. Yeah. Which is, which is very cool. Back to the questions. Here we are. How does one jump to being hired on as an a and E right after Springboard. Previous sales experience here in real estate. Um, so to be hired as an account executive without previous SaaS experience would be challenging, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you, 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 if you were going to pull it off, you would have to probably contact the hiring manager directly and somehow convince them that you have the skills. To be honest, I have never met a sales VP that would take that risk. Um, what I would ask in return there, or in, in return, I don't know what this. What I would ask is if this is truly the career path for you, why wouldn't you be willing to put in nine months as an SDR, show you can crush it, and then get promoted to eight? Like you're talking a year of your life. If this is truly a career path that you're committed to ch- changing into, um, I would be open to being an SDR. You will have to do it for like a year. If you're great at it, you'll be an A. Okay. On living in the world of possibility for a hot mm-hmm. sec, if someone wanted to take this route, you mentioned mm-hmm. talking to the hiring manager. Yes. Um, you know, someone has previous sales experience here in real estate, so at least can talk to you like meeting oh. or selling, you know, X number of houses, X well, amount in revenue. I think it would also depend on your geography. If you're in somewhere like Seattle or San Francisco or Portland or Austin, mm-hmm. there's so many networking events that you could physically go to that would be much more likely to help you transition into the field. If you physically meet these folks, talk to them, get that rapport with them, and then kind of work in your background. Mm -hmm. Um, That one-on-one interaction would potentially be much more successful um, Mm -hmm. than just cold emailing your resume to an HR department. For Um, sure. So I think that would, that would be another way that you could definitely leverage something like this to transition into potentially being an AE. Definitely. And I think something too, that's like, a lot, I mean, just in like thinking through different roles that qualify as tech sales, like you were mentioning earlier, there are a lot of different titles that all do sort of similar bodies of work, if not the same thing. It's just depending on who you're selling to and what you're selling, right? It's a business development rep, it's an SDR, it's an ISR, um, it's you know an account executive, it is a customer success agent, it is, you know, it can be any number of things. So, you know, I think a, an account executive is something that's like very relationship specific and it like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also very like, um, managing that relationship upselling that relationship. And it's like often just very like intense because you are measured by the success of like three accounts sometimes. But, um, there are also like other titles out there that do sort of similar but different flavors of things. Is that Absolutely. fair? That's totally true. Yes. Yeah. So it's possible, but tough. 
but you can and, get- and not, and absolutely not saying it's not possible. Yeah. You just can't do it the traditional drop your resume and like go up through HR. Like that won't work. You're going to have to directly reach out and convince somebody. But on the other hand, if you're truly a good salesperson, that's your job anyway. So go do it. I mean, that's great. If you're that good at sales, you have that background in real estate sales and you believe you're good at it, go sell the hiring manager. Yeah. Plus, I think there's an opportunity here for just like really creative and fun follow up. I mean, there's so many different stories about, um, you know, different creative follow ups that ended up panning out into something. So, Absolutely. Um, OK, pivoting to the next question. We talked about that one for a long time because it's a good one. That was a meaty <laughs> one for sure. Um, what challenges are tech sales people afraid to talk about? Oh, I think it's kind of a dual different way of looking at it. On the one hand, tech firms in general, as I mentioned, and tech sales as well, tends to be much more relational, employee happiness, like all the, a lot of the things you hear like that traditional employers are not, that they don't care about their employees. Tech sales and tech firms in general really do tend to care much more about their employees' welfare. Um, at the end of the day, we're still salespeople. If you don't meet your number for a certain period of time, you won't be a tech salesperson anymore. Um, yeah, so I yeah. think it's kind of, we don't talk about it a lot, but we are measured by a number. SDRs, myself, AEs, everybody's measured by a number. Um, and you were paid well to make that number. If you don't, you won't be doing it forever. Um, and we don't talk about that, um, yeah. but it is a fact of the job. Well, I think um, now that we're in the world of reality, right, can you talk about the timeline that's kind of associated with that then? Let's like, how long does it take for someone not to meet their quota before they should really start being concerned about their position? That will vary, that will vary very much mm -hmm. um, by where you work. A lot of places, there's a huge different spectrum there. I would say in general, unless you're, if you're doing, getting zero results, you're going to have two or three months. Like you're, if you're getting some results and showing progress, you'll have six, nine months. Most likely they'll work with you. Um, as long as you're showing some potential, I know myself and everywhere else have been, had the same view. As long as you're putting in the work and showing some potential, your manager and your team and your company will be willing to work with you. Um, as long as you're putting in the work, following instructions, doing what you're told, showing improvement, there's a lot of leeway. It's only a really short rope if you're getting nothing or you're getting suggestions from your team slash manager slash whatever, and you're not doing them. Like if you're getting feedback, do it. If you're not, then they're going to assume you don't care and you won't have nearly as much row. Um, but as long as you're showing progress and working with your leadership, you're, it's, it's not a couple month thing. It's a multi-month process. Um, and it almost will never be a surprise. You'll know. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. At least it's not like a surprise. It's no. for some reason, I always had it in my mind that it's like, oh, like, well, I mean, first of all, you'll know it because your check isn't going to be as good as you want it to be because your commissions <laughs> won't be there. Um, but usually you have weekly meetings with your team lead, with your manager, whoever, whoever your next level up is. And they will almost always be working with you, especially the biggest thing that I can say there that I think is a little bit of a challenge for some folks I've seen in the past is you are convinced you are doing it right and you're not getting the results. If you're not getting the results and your manager is suggesting you should try these other things, try them. I don't yeah. assume you're doing it right if it's not working. Yeah, which I think is like always, it's just so it's that level of openness and vulnerability, I think can be tough too, but. It can, it can. One of the, it's character building. Being, <laughs> it is, but I mean, I, on the flip side of it, I've had some reps that started off, you know, at 10, 20, 30% of quota and had that kind of, I'm not willing to listen and then eventually changed their attitude and went on to be that same stubbornness is like, I know what I'm doing. Once they were a little bit more open to input, that same stubbornness was a huge asset for them later. So I'm not okay. like, it, it can be turned around to, to a really big asset. Um, it's just a little bit of a mind shift. And I think that dovetails pretty nicely. I think we have time for one final question. I know we're going over a little bit, but um, how can I, as an SDR, stand out to my manager? In a positive way, probably. <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't going to list the negative ways. Yeah. The number one way you can stand out in any sales job in the planet is crush your quota. Like, sure. There's other things that I'll get to in a second, but that is the number one thing. If you are consistently beating quota, you will stand out no matter what job you're in, no matter where you are, Like, because you'll make your manager look good. They have a number two, which is a collection of your numbers. If you're consistently achieving quota, 
they look good. So they're going to love you. Um, yeah. That's the number one thing. The other thing that I would say is consistently following process and accepting feedback. Um, you know, only, I don't know, some percentage of people beat quota. Everybody's trying to, and your manager wants you to get there because it benefits them. Um, so follow what they say, be open to their feedback. Um, the other thing I would also say is it really would be, managers tend to notice this thing. If you go to your peers and ask for help as well, you're not totally depending on them. Establish relationship with the more established SDRs at your company. Ask them to listen in on a call with you. Ask them for tips. Don't rely totally on your manager because your manager only has so much time. Leverage the other successful people in your organization. Excellent. Um, I know that I said that was the final question. I lied. We got a second one, which is which is good. Um, you mentioned SDR and BDR are used interchangeably. Is there any big difference? Advice for which to pursue slash how to decide which is a better fit? No, there's. Uh, it really depends on the organization. Actually, my team has been called SDR to BDR to SDR in a year and a half. They're the same people. Um, so it, it really depends on which organization you're in. Um, the distinction that I would make is not between SDR and BDR. It's between inbound and outbound. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, sometimes inbound is called BDR as opposed to SDR. Um, but the real distinction is inbound and outbound. They're two vastly different jobs, two vastly yeah, different yeah. skill sets. They're just different. They're not the same. Yeah. Um, and I think like on that front too, like outbound means like you are sourcing. You're potentially sourcing, but you're contacting people who never contacted you. So inbound, somebody went to the website, filled out a web form, re did something to say, I'm interested. Mm -hmm. um, so inbound still has sales skills involved, but it's a little bit more of order processing-ish motion because the people came to you already interested as opposed to outbound. This person has never heard of you, potentially never heard of your company, might not have even heard of your product. And you have like two to five minutes to convince them to be interested. Um, so it's a very different motion and methodology. Um, inbound can get promoted to, a, to AE. There's definitely that track there, but it's much more traditional for outbound to get promoted to AE because you're so used to doing that objection handling and kind of baby steps to becoming an account executive in the first place. Mm -hmm. Outbound SDRs do that to a much greater degree than inbound. Outbound also tends to get paid quite a bit more. Okay. Well, I think those are some really key distinctions and <laughs> for whether like who can pursue who wants to pursue what as far as inbound versus outbound i think the last thing we would add to that is if you have zero experience in the field it mm -hmm. might make sense to go to an inbound with a little bit lower pressure a little bit lower skills gap that you might have and then transition to outbound and then transition to ae that might be a potentially good career path yeah definitely i lied again we have one more question <laughs> this is just going to keep <laughs> going to keep happening, which I love. Keep them coming. Um, how do you crush your quota? What's the magic trick to get those sales? Okay, if I knew the the magic trick, I would have my own company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, in general, there's a couple of things. One, you have to have a decent product that has product market fit. Like if the product you're selling is crap, like you you need to find a new company. So that'd be the first thing I say is make sure you have a good product and you believe in it. Otherwise, nothing else I'm going to say matters. Um, the other thing that I would say from there is be really good at consistently reaching out via whatever cadence or methodology your company has and be very good at follow-up. Um, I believe the research shows that it takes like eight to 13 touches to contact a person one time. So you have to be persistent. Um, and you have to be persistent with your follow-up. They say, call me next Tuesday, set a task in whatever system you have to call them next Tuesday. Um, like if people that are disorganized and don't have that systematic methodology are not successful. Yeah, definitely. And also just, you said touches and I realized that might be sort of a sales specific term or a marketing oh, um, specific term. So it's some general combination of calls, emails, LinkedIn, um, WhatsApp, if you're outside the United States, some method of reaching out and trying to contact somebody by right, whatever right. method you're trying to do. Yeah, I regard it as like an interaction and it could yeah. be like any type of interaction, but it does, you know, sort of like something's happening for sure. Yes. Um, yeah. So just to summarize that, I think it's to know sort of your product and who is like a successful mm -hmm. customer for it. 
also sort of linking it back to what we said earlier is knowing your style and sort of like your voice and how you generally interact with people. And then three is just being really consistent and um, numerous with the the types of follow-up that you have. And I think creative follow-up is also important here too. It's like inserting details about the person, about what they, um, you know, are concerned about or what their biggest problem is, um, probably proactively offering a solution um, and like really building trust with the people that you're selling to, to be a knowledgeable player in that field. Absolutely. I think one thing that you just said that we really haven't touched on that is important is knowing your voice. Phone skills, we talk about it as just phone skills. There's a wide variety and wide spectrum. I have folks on my team that sound a little bit more like those announcers at the end of advertisements, talking million miles an hour, and that works for them. I have other folks that are very soft-spoken, very intuitive, very listening, and everything in between. And what works for you, like I tend to talk really fast. Some folks on my team really, really don't, and they're much more methodical. You need to do what works for you. Um, you'll be taught some style, but it, it, you need to figure out what works for your style of speaking and your personality. And yeah. there's no one right way. Yeah, there's no one right way to sell. No, the right way to sell is whatever works for you to get results. <laughs> That's yeah. the right way. Yeah, for sure. <sighs> well, excellent. I love going over and answering more questions than than is expected. Um, but Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us here today. If there are any final questions, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, but this is really illuminating and I hope it was really helpful and I hope we get to do this again. This is great. Awesome, Amy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Bye everyone. Bye y'all.